probably from its inception. I can't speak about the early days. I can speak about the more recent days. This has been a church dedicated to serving far beyond its own walls. You and I have a choice as to how we're going to deal with change. Why do we stop growing? Why do we reach a certain point when we say, I'm done? We have a big job to do in Mesa. Of that, there is no doubt. And a good-sized job in Arizona. No doubt about that either. And I got to tell you something. I believe that God has a wonderful future for Central Christian Church. If I did not believe that, I would not be where I'm at. I believe the best days of Central are ahead of us. And I've said that before, and I'm going to continue to say that, because I believe that to the bottom of my heart. We exist to be a service station in the Lord's work for the entire world. You want to grow? Have vision. What is vision? The ability to see what other people don't see. The ability to look forward. The ability to literally, as I said earlier, stand on your tiptoes and look out and wonder what God has for you this year that you haven't yet experienced. Vision. And somebody said it this way, when your memories exceed your dreams, your life is over. Could you imagine the impact on the world we could make? Could you imagine that God actually has more in store for us than the status quo? I do not think God put us here to just exist. In 1979, Dr. E. Leroy Lawson became Central Christian Church's lead pastor, where he led the church for the next 20 years. He oversaw the growth and vision of Central and the building of our Mesa campus. As a church, we are who we are today because of the impact of his leadership and legacy. Please welcome back home, Roy Lawson. Oh, it feels good to be with you. Before I do what I'm supposed to do, I would like you to join me in thanking the crew that put this whole thing together tonight. Will you? I am in awe. I used to work here, and we were good. You just got better. And I'm so, so glad that I lived to see this night. And so glad that I can join the rest in giving thanks for what Central Christian has been, is, and will be. You, you certainly have exceeded my greatest expectations, and I, I thank God and I thank you for that. And I thank you for inviting Joy and me and the family to come to your party. And it's a good party. Uh, that word party is kind of interesting to me because it's related, it's really the, the root of another word, participation. We're getting ready now for our communion time, and this is about participating. Here's the, here's the scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. And most of you know this, but let me read it. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Now, it's that word participation that stops us when I read this scripture. When he refers to communion as, as the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, we, we quickly grasp what he's talking about. Because communion in, in some uh, fellowships is, is referred to as the Eucharist, the, the thank fest. And we do come together every week to give thanks for the life that we have for the life that we can have, for the blessings we have received, the blessings we can give. So yes, it's a time of thanksgiving, and the cross symbolizes what we have received from God. 
Most of all, and best of all, we have received forgiveness, grace, a second chance, and for some, a third, and a fourth, and a fifth chance, because God doesn't give up on us. And, and so we give thanks for all of this, but, but it's also participation. It's a reminder that we belong to the body of Christ. We don't, we, don't, we don't just belong, we participate. We're joined with others who are participating. It was so much fun to sit here in the front and, and just watch you young people up here participating. You made my back ache, but it was kind of fun to watch you. We participate in the body, the whole body. So, so there's a historical dimension here. We look back to what was done for us on the cross. We, we look around at all of these that we are partying with. We look to the future for what is ahead of us. Now, for some here tonight, life hasn't always been easy for you. And one of the things that encourages me in our coming together and our having the communion services is that it's a reminder that we do not walk this lonesome valley by ourselves. We, we come because of our faith in God. We come because of our trust in one another. I've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, as have many of you. And I, I knew the comfort that comes from the Lord, but I also knew the comfort that came from the other people who were participating with me. So I can't take communion and think just about myself. It's not about just me and God. It's about more than that. And that lesson was taught me so graphically a number of years ago. Joy and I, at that time, were ministering in Indianapolis, and we had been asked to go to India to check up on a missionary that was in some difficulty there to see if we could discern what was happening and, and, and be a bit of help. While we were there, we attended three different Indian churches one Sunday, and I, I spoke for all of them. But the one that I will never forget was the poorest one of all. We were in the city. Of, it was called Madras then. It's Chennai now. It was in the city, but the, the church felt like a, a rural village church. Humble building like a thatched roof, woven mat sides, open at the bottom, open at the top so that the wind could come, or the breeze could come through. It was hot in there. Dirt floor, mats around. I looked in and I saw that the people would be sitting on the floor, men on one side, women on the other. I looked at the front and <laughs> there was a little rickety communion table and beside the communion table was the only chair in that humble building. And that chair was for the guest speaker. Joy had to sit on the floor. I got the chair. Seemed right to somehow. I, I felt pretty special, actually, as the only person in the room supported by a chair. I could look out over the whole congregation. And it was apparent as I studied the congregation that I was indeed in a poor church. Their dress was simple. They, they were sickly. I heard a lot of coughing. These are people for whom life was not easy. My smugness disappeared as the time for communion came. I'd already noticed that little table that I told you about. There was bread on the table for communion. And one cup, and that worried me. I knew what was coming. For they would take a piece of the bread, and they would take a sip from the cup. Now, I know how germs operate. And I sat on my chair feeling so sorry for joy because I knew they would serve me first because I was the speaker. And I was dead wrong. 
They saved the best for the last. As I sat on my chair, watching that cup go through the congregation, wipe with a dirty rag, passed on to the next person. And I saw it coming toward me. I've studied hygiene. I know about germs. And that cup, which had touched the lips of all those poor, sickly people, was coming to me. And all of a sudden, I didn't feel so good sitting up there on the chair where everybody could see me because I had a decision to make. Could I fake it and not take it? I didn't think I could. And I didn't think I should. How could I offend my guests, or my, my hosts, I really should say, how could I offend them? By refusing, here's that word, to participate. So, when the cup came to me, I drank of it. I participated. Two days later, we went from Delhi to Agra, Agra to see the Taj Mahal. The only thing I can tell you about the Taj Mahal is that it had inadequate facilities. I was so sick. All the way down to Agra and all the way back from Agra, I prayed that I would not embarrass myself, that I would be able to contain it. That night, back in Delhi, Joy and I were at the YWCA on our cots. I, I know how to treat a lady when we travel. She had her cot, I had my cot. I lay on my cot right on the edge of delirium, in and out, conscious enough that I worried. And I thought, if I become delirious, out of control, what's Joy going to do with me in this strange country? Found out later she was lying on her cot and she was thinking, if he dies, what will I do with him? <laughs> and here's the worst part of the whole story. I never figured out what she should do with me sick, but she did figure out to do what, what she should do with me dead. <laughs> Why is this my most memorable communion story? Because it gave me an insight into the meaning of this very simple little service that we do weekly. The, the contrast that morning between the poverty and the sickness I saw in that congregation and its rich, white guest preacher could not have been greater. Yet the differences were all erased as we all ate the same bread and drank from the same cup, pointing to the love of God and the sacrifice of Christ. In India that morning, we experienced communion as participation. Partic participation in the body of Christ, the church, which I've been a part of all my life. More than that, a participation in the lives of each other. There were people there, people like me, people like you, with whom I am comfortable and with whom I feel safe. But there were also people there that morning participating who are not like me at all. Their skin is a different color. Their language is one I don't understand. Their customs seem quite strange. They eat food I don't like. And their, their circumstances are such that I probably could not survive in them. But here I was, 
eating from the same loaf, drinking from the same cup, sharing their germs, and suffering the consequences. So, so here we are, recognizing our togetherness with our own kind. But I'm hoping that we are seeing communion as an invitation to participate in the whole body of Christ. We used to sing an, an old hymn, in Christ there is no east or west, in him no north or south, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. So communion trains our eyes upward toward a cross, which reminds us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So now we participate with one another and with them, the whole body of Christ, red and yellow, black and white, rich and poor, healthy and sickly. We participate. When you came in, you were given this, this, this portable communion set. You'll take the top film off and there is the bread and the next and there is the grape juice will you do that now and then hold it for just a moment and we'll take together and then after we have taken it just keep the elements and as you leave later deposit them on your way out. So now, in the name of Christ, take the bread that Jesus took and blessed, gave thanks, gave to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And then, in like manner, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, this is my blood of the new covenant. Drink this now in remembrance of me. And now, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we've had this privilege of participating, of remembering, and of giving thanks for the life we have because of you. And after having been here and partic participated in this service, help us so live this next week that it is evident that we belong to one another and to you and to all the Lord our God has called us to serve and to love in Christ's name. Amen.